Okay, good morning again, and welcome to our first seminar for the morning, which is with Alison Edgar, and this is going to be talking about the successful sales. Um, this seminar will provide you with a clear-cut sales process and a strategy of how to stay positive and proactive, something that we all need at the moment, whilst using behavior aids to improve relationships building, which converts to sales. Um, I'm delighted that we have Alison here today um, and very proud for her to announce that she received a recent MBE. Now, she doesn't talk about this a lot, so um, just to get that out of the way. Um, but Alison, I'm delighted to have you here. Um, I think this is going to be very entertaining. She does want to get your engagement, so um, it's best not to be shy. Please use the chat feature um and i think uh, th this will be very very useful i think sales some people recently saying oh should we be pushing this out we have to push this out and it's not a dark mystic art this is all about people skills this is about using your personality and projecting and use showing that confidence um anson has this by the bag loads so I'm going to hand you over to Alison. There's going to be a slight delay here because we've been testing this out a little bit earlier with the slides. So nothing has gone wonky with the technology, um, but I'll hand you over to Alison now. Alison, a very warm welcome, and I uh, hope you enjoy it, and I hope everybody watching enjoys it as well. So I will leave you to it. Oh, thank you, Forbes. Thank you so much for having me. So um, we do have some slides, but it is not, you know, lots of PowerPoint. What I do like is I like a really engaging session. So I can already see that Alex is in the chat. So if you are using chat, let's just make sure it's all working. Give me a hello in there and let me see. Now, I can cannot see how many people are in the room. So um, what we are going to do in the session, again, I will be asking you to tell me yes, if you're on board with what I'm saying. Um, and also the Q&A. So if you're not familiar with the tool on the right hand side, you have got the section which says Q&A. So um, for, for, hi, Nicola. Oh, hello, Nicola. I think we've actually met before. Hello, Kerry ann So um, what for as I say, I don't talk much about the MBE, but I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is um, I'm still in a bit of shock. Oh, Anthony's in the room as well. Alex, Delphine. Oh, I recognize some of the names. So that's really good. It's lovely to see you in the room with me today. So I don't really talk about the MBE because um, I think I'm still in a bit of shock. Um, and the reason I'm in a bit of shock is I actually left school at 16, I'm dyslexic, I've got no qualifications. So to be awarded an honour by the Queen um, for the work that I do for entrepreneurship and small business just has actually blown me away. But there's another reason that I don't talk about it because it was only announced, not, not Saturday day, the Saturday before. But what happened was I had the uh, email about the MBE in June. So I've had to keep a secret from June. So uh, that's part of the reason. So I'm very excited. Oh, look, you're all telling me that you're here. Yes, Nicola Gawkin says, yes, we have met at Excel. I came to your sales session. Hopefully, Nicola, you're already using some of my top tips. Um, but if not, then I'll, I'll give you a refresher. So let's have a little start. Now, sales, oh, it's a funny old fish sales, isn't it? Because it gets such a bad reputation. Um, if I had a penny for everybody who says, oh, I don't like sales, I hate sales, sales, oh, I don't enjoy it. I could actually be sitting in my villa in the south of France by now. So I'm hoping during our session, which will last, um, I'm planning to talk for about 45 minutes, keep you engaged for 45 minutes, then take some questions at the end. But I, I, fingers crossed you can all see my slides. If you can see the slides, give me a little yes in the chat so that I know you can all see it. Give me a yes. Um, can you see it? You can see the slides. Oh, look, you're all shy now. Either that or you can't see them. I am taking it that you can see them. So one of the things you'll see on the top of that first slide is it says, oh, great, everybody's telling me yes now. I genuinely believe 
when it's delivered correctly, that sales and customer service is exactly the same thing. So again, I know that most people who are in the room at the moment own a business or work for a business and, and just want to get some sales tips. Now, I um, never really wanted to work in sales. And I think that's one of those things that people say a lot. They kind of fell into sales um, just by chance or they set up a business because they were passionate about what they do. So um, after having left school at 16, I found the world of hospitality um, and, and I became a hotel receptionist. Now, I think, again, anybody that's in hospitality at the moment, I really feel their pain because I've worn their shoes firsthand. Um, the travel, that, the hospitality industry led me to traveling around the world. I worked in Sydney, I worked in Cape Town, I worked in the Channel Islands. I worked for companies like Southern Suns and Radisson. So I was really well trained in hospitality. But when I came back to the UK, I met my husband. So this was 1993, I think. And I was working away, doing my shifts, managing hotels. And he had one of these Monday to Friday, nine to five jobs. And I had a choice. And I, I talk about choice a lot. So I had the choice. I could either find a Monday to Friday, nine to five job, or I was going to get dumped. So I actually quite liked, you know, this boy. In fact, he's a keeper. We're 20 odd years down the track. So he was worth making a choice for. But I worked in the first ever call centre that BT opened in Scotland. It was in Motherwell. And it was a sales, outbound sales call centre. Now, a lot of you will think, eh! but at that time, there was no internet. So we had to communicate in some ways. And it was direct mail, direct response. So it was marketing and sales. You know, marketing sent the message out and sales closed the sales. And I really want to talk to you. I will talk to you throughout the slides about this, the difference between sales and marketing. Anyway, when the call centre opened, I was one, I was the first person to make a sale. And that's why I think it was my hospitality background that really stood me on good stead because that gave me confidence that I was delivering a service. So we did talk about confidence and that's one of the things that I really want you to take away from this session. So um, I think it's quite interesting again because a lot of people who are in this session will have set up their own business. So I actually set up my business as a sales trainer. I went on to work for big corporate companies in the UK and what I decided to do was teach small businesses what I had learned because we didn't, um, you know, sell in advertising. So after BT, I worked for Yale. What I'd, I really understood was that small businesses didn't know how to sell. So that was my mission was to teach them to help improve their fortunes. But during the time when I set the business up, there used to be a lot of government funding. So there was things called growth vouchers and growth accelerator. I'm sure some people who are in the room on the chat are, have gone through those programs, delivering support to businesses on those programs. But in 2015, the government pulled all the support. So they, they pulled all the advice support that I was getting paid for and was helping small businesses. So I had to then come up with a different move. And I think that's the thing that's so current at the moment. We can't do things the way that we did them. We have to find different ways of doing things. So what I had to do was find a way to give my knowledge to people who didn't have much money. And I think that's where what came from writing the book. Now, you know, I, I, in this session, one of the things we want to give you is confidence to be able to do things. And we'll talk about mindset shortly. But for me as a dyslexic, writing a book um, was something that I never thought I could do. And I think it's about taking the first step. So I know that some people in the audience will think, oh, I would like to do this, or I'd like to do that, or I'd like to start phoning my customers again, or I'd like to do it, but you know, I'm, I'm a bit worried it's not the right time. Today is the day I really want you to think about the actions that you're going to take. So Secrets of Successful Sales, it sold out on Amazon on launch day. People had to wait two weeks for a copy of the book. It also, one of the thrills, apart from the MBE, obviously, was it was a WH Smith top 10 business book. So I would go to Paddington or I would be at Heathrow and I would see my book there. 
Um, and it was also featured in The Independent as one of the top business books written by a woman. So um, I know that Amanda has read it. So she's got Secrets of Successful Sales. And so does Nicola. It's great, great to see some people have got the book. But the book, everything I teach is based on what's in the book. And everything that's in the book is based on what I did as a top performer in sales and what the other top performers did in the blue chip companies. So it's not based on theory, it's based on tangible things that you can actually do straight away. Um, but one of the first things, again, I see this time and time again, and I know that there's people in the room who have seen me live, and that, you know, I know that they'll know that I'm very proactive with getting people to put their hands up. And again, in the new world, we can't do that. But one of the things that comes up time and time and time again is a lot of small businesses do not fully understand the difference between sales and marketing. And I think that's the fundamental to sales. You have to really know, oh, look, you know, Fred, everybody's been reading the book. I'm so excited. Thank you. So um, again, those of you who have read the book will know that when I was 17, 16, 17, I used to play golf for the West of Scotland. So, you know, I could talk all day about how life is like golf, but I really want to focus on sales and marketing. So what happens is marketing is one of the fundamental things. So I call that they put the T in the ground and they put the ball in the T. So that's your website, that's your social media, that's your mail shots, that's your any interaction that's not really involving you as a human. So again, it's the marketing things, the things that people can read and touch and feel. Um, then what happens is, as in sales, we take the ball down the fairway, put it on the green and put it in the hole because only when the ball goes in the hole do you make any money. And I think it's interesting, um, you know, if I do this live, there's always somebody from marketing will put up their hand and go, Alison, that's wrong. It's wrong. And I go, okay, why is that wrong? They go, no, what happens as in marketing? We put the tea in the ground, we put the ball in the tea, we put it right down to the pin and you sales guys tap it in and take all the glory. I think that is the fundamental, that if your marketing is good, actually making sales is fairly easy. And, and we look, and, and part of the reason, it's been an interesting journey for everyone over the last seven months, but for me, one of my personal things was for my team, I decided not to furlough. I decided to continue to look for new revenue streams to pay the wages for, for three reasons. Structure. I've got quite a young team and I think furlough created mayhem and having structure that people still came to work every day helped them. Mental health. Again, I, I believe that if you overthink what the situation is at the moment, you can it can just lead to balls of anxiety. And I, I wasn't prepared to do that to my team. And the third thing, having worked in advertising sales, I know the companies that come out at the other end stronger through recession are the ones who continue to market. And that was the three reasons. So again, I think keeping your marketing high, you're, you're you know, using things like LinkedIn, you know, there's lots of stuff that you can do organically to raise awareness. And to be fair, you know, I wouldn't be speaking to you now at your event if I wasn't constantly self-promoting what I do and the things that I do on LinkedIn, because that's where most of my work comes from. So again, um, the, the, the way that I look at marketing is why would you blend in when you can stand out? So hopefully that gives you some ideas on, on your marketing and how it ties together. But the one thing I didn't mention is the holy grail. And that's the hole in one for marketing. So for example, Amazon and eBay, that's not sales at all. That's literally someone goes in, they see the product and they buy it. And we've spent years having to, really, I sell pretty much everything. I, I keep that role in my business because I love sales and I really um, enjoy that part. But we started recently doing some webinars. So again, similar to this, uh, but to keep revenue from the, you're coming in for the team, we did them ticketed. So we did the 15, 15 pound, including VAT per ticket. And we did it as a high volume. So we usually get between 80 and 100 people that pay £15 a ticket. And with that, 
that is a hole in one for marketing. So we finally found a hole in one for marketing because prior to that, I've had to be involved. So again, if you think marketing is the, the, the online, the hard mail, the emails, the mail shots, and sales is where you come in. And I think that's the part where lots of people really struggle unless they've been sales trained. So one of the things at the moment, the world is different. Um, and we do assume it's not the right time to say, oh, it's not the right time to have that conversation about business. You know, we don't mind phoning people up and asking them how they are because we see that as a, a, a customer service, but it, it's kind of purposeless. You, you really still have to get involved in a sales transactional conversation because if you don't sell, you don't have a business. And if you've got employees, you can't pay the wages. And if you've got a family, you can't pay them. So I think, again, as Forbes said at the start of the chat, it's really important um, that you can sell, that we have to sell to keep the economy going. So again, for those of you who might be thinking, I don't know, is it the right time? If, if you really believe that what your product or service does enhances your customer, then it's your duty to do that. And if you don't, maybe you need to rethink your offering like we did with the webinars. Hopefully that's starting to put some light bulbs into your little brains and talking about the brains mindset. Um, so I want to tell you a little story about my dad because I think it's quite relevant to, to the current situation in mindset. So um, oh, Maybe about two years ago, I was looking at Facebook and somebody said that there was a, a, oh, a debate, shall we call it a heated Facebook debate? And somebody put in the comments, don't worry about that person, they've got a, a fixed mindset. Um, so if we have a look and, and think about a fixed mindset, what does that actually mean? So again, when it comes to sales, I'm either good at it or I'm not or anything, you know, oh, I tried that and it didn't work. Failure is the limit of my ability. So you might have tried to do sales, it didn't work and you jump back into marketing. I don't like to be challenged. So what happens if the customer doesn't like me? What happens if they're rude to me? What happens if they're abrupt to me? Um, I'll just stick to what I know. And then feedback, you know, um, they might say that I'm pushy, they might say that I'm that. So again, a lot of the things to do with sales is we get trapped in our own brain. So what I want you, you know, my top tips, again, some of you will, will be in the coaching space, some of you will be in the business support space, so you'll know about the difference between fixed and growth mindset. And if you've got young children, um, schools really hone this in now to the kids when they're learning spellings and numbers and, and they, they, they want them to fail. So again, I can learn to do anything I want. So again, if there's anybody who, who is in the room who came in thinking, oh, sales, oh, then I, I want you to move over to growth um, and try it. It's okay if you try it and it fails because you learned something. It's all about learning. Um, and I take the feedback on board, you know, I'll try it again. So to tell you the wee story about my dad, and this is why I think it's really poignant. So my dad was born in 1935. Um, and when he was eight years old, so in 1943, he got knocked down by a push bike, of all things. You know, a push bike knocked him down. And it meant that he couldn't um, walk. And the doctors told him that you, you will not be able to walk again. And again, with a fixed mindset, you would believe that, wouldn't you? If a doctor said, oh, I can't walk. And you tell yourself, you train your brain to think, I can't do that. But my dad had a growth mindset and he's like, no, I'm going to learn to walk. So there's photos of him in his little tiny wheelchair and then with his little calipers learning to walk. And in 1943, there was quite a lot going on in the world. Um, so he was put into a hospital that was phys for physical illness and for mental illness. He was um, an orphan because his mum had had a nervous breakdown and had to go into hospital permanently and his dad had died. So it was, it took a lot, you know, he had to self-motivate him. And I think that's the word that's really important is self-motivate himself. Then what happened was he ended up um, being able to walk and, and to an extent, not always had a limp, but he managed to blag his national service. So he must have done something right. 
He then, again, couldn't get qualifications because he'd missed out on his education. And he went to work in the shipyards in Glasgow. So for those of you who know, I'm from Clydebank, which is famous for a couple of things, wet, wet, wet specifically, and also the QE2 and all the ships that were built. So my dad worked on the boards. And at that time, he was actually offered a job as a high school, uh, sorry, a college lecturer. But he was married to my mum. My mum was quite a small town girl and he turned it down again, his fixed mindset. So he'd gone from having growth mindset to fixed mindset and it had changed him um, and he turned it down. So as a result of him turning that down, what happened was we never bought a house. We, we always lived in a high rise council flat. We never got a dog. You know, that's one of my biggest regrets as a child. We never got a dog. So again, what you have to think about is how your mindset has a knock-on effect to other people. So again, your family, your customers, it's your mindset really does spread through other people. But what happened was um, he, Peter, yes, you can have the mindset slide. Um, and thank you. It is Carol Dweck's work. She is amazing. That's the, the work they do in schools. So to go back to the story, what happened was when he was 55, the world changed like the world changed now. And these computer things kicked in. So on the shipyards, what they did was they used AutoCAD. So they used automation. Now, I'm sure we can all relate to that now. Automation really does affect the number of employees we need, because if we can automate, we don't have to have as many people, which affects the job market. So my dad had a choice. The shipyards at that time were rife with fixed mindset and unions and, oh, no, we can't do this and we can't do that. Oh, I'm on the scrap heap. And, you know, those words are ringing through towns in our country right now. That fear is there right now. And what my dad did, he went back at 55 years old to do his HMD in AutoCAD. That growth mindset that he had as a child kicked back in again. And what happened was my dad became a commodity because he knew the board, he knew the fundamentals of AutoCAD, but he could also keep up with the young boys. And he became the most sought after draftsman in Scotland and the north of England because he found his growth mindset. He did things differently and he smashed it. He made more money at the end of his career than he had done in the whole of his life. So the reason I talk about that is, again, we do assume that we can't do things, but now is the time that we should be doing things differently, but we can only do it with a growth mindset. So how do we switch our mindset if we think that maybe uh, that uh, uh, the mindset that we've got is fixed? And I'm not saying that we're all set in there with fixed mindset, but if you do identify, here's my top tips to changing it. So again, I'll bring it back to sales. So we start because what happens is our thoughts equate to our feelings and our feelings equate to our behaviors. So if we look, if you think I don't like sales, oh, oh I, can't, I can't sell. I think that's the one that comes up most often. I can't sell. I tried it before, I'm rubbish at sales. I literally, if I was to do this before this slide and ask you your thoughts on sales, we would get all of that, those things. I need you. Guys, I'm looking straight down the camera at you, sitting in your kitchen, sitting in your lounge, at you. If this is you, then what I need to do is I need you to really think and change that can't into the can. Um, because what happens if we think we can't, we become anxious and scared and worried. And worry and fear is the thing that holds us back. Then what happens is we shy away from taking action. So we say, oh, you know, I'm not going to bother picking up the phone. And you go back and you go, I'll just use marketing. I'll just send an email. I'll just send a mail shot. I'll just, and you're not engaging with your customers. You're not moving into sales mode. And again, it's not about buy my product, buy my product, buy my product. It's about really asking great questions, which I'll cover shortly to get what the customer needs. So um, I can't sell yet. Go Karen, yet. Woohoo! I love it. Um, so one of the things is I need you to try and stop that can't mentality. And one of the things I do, one of my top tips is I think it starts when you get up in the morning. 
Because at the moment, if you wake up thinking, oh, the world's closed, oh, it's awful, this, 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 it just has a knock-on effect. So one of my top tips is music. So I don't know about you, and I can't even mention the name of the speaker because if I do it, it's, there's one in the room and it will start to talk to me. But so I, 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 I set the speaker, I'm sure you all know the speaker that I mean, um, uh, to go off in the morning, it goes off at six o'clock, it gives me, um, it tells me what the weather is, and then it will play a song. Now, the song that I choose, again, I've got a variety of them. One of them, for anybody that's Scottish in the audience, is the Proclaimers. I'm on my way from misery to happiness today. Uh -huh. So I, I, that one, also take that. Today, this could be the greatest day of your life. So again, if you see that, um, if you feel that you're slipping into the kind of negative, if you start having a bit of music that's positive, what that does is it makes you think, actually, I can do this. And also then you will pick up the phone. You will do things differently. You'll be more confident. So um, thank you. It's a good tune. Um, your talk has spurred me on. I will definitely be nurturing my mindset more. Boom! So I can't change everyone in the room, but if I can change one person, then that's me on the right direction. Um, so again, this is one of the big takeaways for you guys. When it's delivered correctly, sales and customer service is exactly the same thing. So what I want is, again, I've been doing a bit of the talking now. I want you to give me, uh, if, you, if you're on my page, if you're getting what I'm saying, if you believe sales and customer service is exactly the same thing, give me a yes in the chat. I want to see some yeses coming through. Let me see what's going on. Music is fantastic. Agreed. Peter says agreed. Who else is in the room? Give me some yeses if you are on my page. James says yes. Oh, come on, I want the yeses. There's a wee bit of a lag here with our... Um... Ah, Janine says a capital yes. Oh, look. Yeah, there we go. Anthony Sears says capital yes. Amanda says yes. Jude says definitely. Claire says yes. Oh, I can't pronounce it. I don't know, but it's a big yes. Lorraine, oh, look, you're all coming in now. Come in now. Brilliant. Rebecca Dalton says, capital yes and two thumbs up. Alex says, defo. Brilliant. Okay, so I've got you all in the mood to believe that sales is amazing. It is great fun when you do it correctly. But now, I think what we should do is have some skills. Let's get some skills. What does this mean? So I know some of you have read the book. For those of you who haven't read the book, I obviously recommend you jump onto Amazon and get it. It's only £9.68. And that's why I put everything in the book so that people can access my knowledge for under a tenner. And to be fair, I think that's actually part of the reason that I got the MBE because I took time out of the business to do things to try and help people. And I think that's where the MBE came from. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, right. So I talked about the four key pillars. That's what's in the book. So the first one is around behaviours. As Forbes, uh, Forbes said at the start, you know, it's about building good relationships. The next one is process. So process is, is interesting because if you look at James Dyson, he manufactures, let's say vacuums, does a lot of things. But if you look at the manufacturing process, when you come at the end of it, you should have a vacuum. But not everything goes through quality control. And that's the same as sales. You are not going to sell to everyone. If I can't sell to everyone, how can I possibly teach you to do it? The next thing we're going to cover today is strategy as well. So um, I've got some theories, including Alison Edgar's Big Balls. And then that will lead to confidence. So let's have a look at the first pillar. So again, it is a whistle stop tour because I have go, you've only got me for an hour. So I want to try and teach you as much as I can. So um, I'm not going to take this because there's a lag, but I am taking it that everyone in this audience has met somebody they don't get on with particularly well. And that also affects our business relationships with our potential clients. So I believe it comes down to this one cross. So let me explain. It's around William Moulton Marston's disc and it's around Carl Jung's psychology. I'm a huge fan of psychology. So I believe that our brain holds the key to sales. 
So what I'm going to do on this slide, you'll see that different people have different views of the world. Some people are task focused, other people are relationship focused, some people are extrovert and other people are introvert. And I think that's where, you know, if we look at the people that we don't bond with, that's what affects sales. Um, and the other thing that you have got is um, if we have a look at what the top performers did, you never know their behaviours because they are so good at adaption. And I don't mean being fake or phony. I don't mean that, but I mean adapting to the way that people want to be dealt with. So what I'm going to do, I'm hypothetically going to take you all back to school, right? So I'm hi don't worry, don't panic. Peter, don't panic. We're not going back to school. It's okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm hypothetically going to give you an English test. And the English test will last for 30 minutes. And what will happen in that test, you'll have different people in your class. So if you close your eyes, you can probably, for me, I can actually smell the classroom. <laughs> I can smell those wooden desks. Ooh. And what will happen is the test lasts 30 minutes. After 20 minutes, the red behavior, the task-focused extrovert will put up their hand. Miss, miss. I'm finished. Check me out. I'm a winner. You're all losers. I'm bored. What do you want me to do now? But when the test paper result comes back, oh, I didn't realize there was another side to that paper. These are the customers that would be like, right, what do you want? Tell me what you get two minutes. Just give me the price. And then if they buy it, they don't even know what they've bought. And then they complain they bought the wrong thing. So again, it's your job as the salesperson to manage that relationship. Hey, some of you in here actually might be a red behavior type. Then we move down to staying on the extrovert sides, but the yellow behavior, the relationship focused extrovert. So the test lasts 30 minutes. After 10 minutes, the yellow, the uh, relationship focused extrovert will be having a chat. Oh yeah, Nicola, yeah, we met at Excel, didn't we? Oh yeah, do you remember that stand? Alison McCall, can you go on with the test? Oh, I forgot there was a test. I was having a chat with Nicola about the expo. So again, think about your customers, the people that you deal with, think about your own behavior types, that actually these are the ones that you, you say, oh yeah, I do social media. My, oh, I love social media. Oh, I would love it if you did that. Oh, that sounds fantastic. But then when you phone them up and you go, um, who? Nicola? Expo? What one? They're easily distracted. They're a little bit like Dory the fish. And they make a big impact on you, but you don't necessarily make a big impact on them. Now, what I should say at this point, we're not just one colour. We're all of them. But it's these blends that again, people buy people and they buy people like them. So by not adapting behaviors, you're actually shrinking your pool of the people that you can sell to. So that's your extroverts. And again, you can see that my, uh, my animation is big, my voice is loud, my, you know, my gesturing is high. Now we're going to move in to the introverts. So we'll start with the greens, the relationship focused introverts and again because they're introverts they do this wonderful thing that they engage their brain before they speak they're thinking things they're thinking introspectively so I'll take you back to the test and what will happen is after 10 minutes the green using emotional intelligence will notice that somebody in the room has got a headache this this my friend Anthony got a headache I think I should take him to the nurse so for the greens the headache was more important than the test and when it comes to making decisions they get frightened that they make the wrong decision when it comes to sales so they have to talk it through with other people so again putting them in a corner to push them to make a decision is just going to push them away <clears throat> and it's not that they can't make a decision it's just they don't want to upset other people by making the wrong decision. They think about the knock-on effect for everyone else. Then we go to our last colour, and that's our blue behaviours. So that's the task-focused introverts. 
the test lasts for 30 minutes, right? And right up to the last second, they're checking their work, double checking their work. Did I dot my I's? Did I cross my T's? Because for them, they strive for perfection. So I ask you again, who's ever met somebody that don't get on with? And usually it's the diagonal opposite. So if you're red, I want it done now. I want it done like right now. I'm going to shout. I'm going to. It's the greens that take longer to make decisions that you don't build the relationship with. And if you're yellow, you're leading the Disney parade. Woohoo! It's those blues that don't show any expression. You need all the detail that you're not building the relationship with. If you're here and Carrie. Cherry Greenland, it's those pushy, pushy reds. And what you do is you don't really want to hurt their feelings, so you just ignore them. You ghost them. You don't respond to their texts. You don't respond to the messages. You just hope that the ground will open up and swallow them alive. And then if you're here in blue and you need all the facts and figures, it's those annoying yellows that never shut up. So hopefully from that, you will see... Um, how the behaviours is just the fundamental of how we build the relationship for sales. And I, the, the way the slide pack comes, I usually bring this up in two, but I can't do it. But what I would say is, I would say most of you were brought up, treat other people the way that you want to be treated. Well, don't. From now on, today's takeaway is you treat other people the way that they want to be treated. And again, I know it's whistle stop. There is more about this in the book. So... Um, if we have a look, the next thing, that, that's around behaviour. So that's pillar one. The next thing is around process. Now, I think this is a bit that I see small businesses really just don't know. They don't know. Corporate, if you've been trained in corporate, you know it like the back of your hand. And I can watch a good salesperson, right? And I love sales. And I know the next word that will come out their mouth. It's like, it's like Swan Lake. You can watch it at Covent Garden. You can watch it at Sydney Opera House and you'll know the next step. If you know the steps of the sales, it just makes a big difference. So uh, well, again, I'll give you what I see as uh, um, the, the fundamentals of where people go wrong in sales. And again, I think, you know, you guys are the chamber, so you do networking. You've been to networking events all over the place. And during lockdown, you'd probably be doing a lot. And it's, and it's this, you know, I call it like the Titanic. So if you're on the Titanic and it's about to sink, the first person you would want to save would normally, if you're honest, be yourself because you'd want to get back to your family and your friends. Although a lot of people say the band, the children. And I think, again, that comes back down to the behaviours. So um, who you are, where you're from, and what it's about. So at what, at what I would say, again, this is homework for you all. Another top tip. I, I, I want you to look at your emails and your website and things because a lot of people, and I do this, and I do that, and the message is on LinkedIn. Oh, you must feel my pain. Connection requests. And I do this, and I do the next thing. I, I don't honestly care. What are you going to do for me? So again, I think a lot of people lack purpose when it comes to sales. So how do we build those relationships? Again, I think that's the other thing that's really important. And and it, it's to do with children and, and when you were a child. So I, sometimes if it's live, I'll say, who in the audience has got children? And some people put their hand. Who in the audience has ever been a child? And oh, I got 100% a hand. So I love that. But to me... This is the crux. If you take nothing away from today, take this. Oh, I was going to say, take this or take that. Um, today, this could be the greatest day of your life. But think like a child. So when children are about two, they learn to speak. Um, and what happens is they will, actually, somebody says that we are lost connection. I think we're back because Patrick is making comments about the book. So I think we're okay. So think like a child. What do I mean by that? So the most common question that young children, two-year-old children ask is why, 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 why? But they're not taught to ask that. We are little sponges. And, and when we were little children, we're on one-to-one -one with mum, dad, granny, guardian. Then, you know, we then maybe go one-to-eight at nursery. And, you know, we, we, we stay in small groups. So when somebody says why, they actually get an answer. 
Um, I apologise in advance for anybody in education because I blame you for the fact that we really struggle with sales because what happens is we then go from a small ratio to 1 to 30. And can you imagine 30 kids go, why, 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 why? The crux of sales, and I'm going to go fast here, who, what, why, when, where, and who? Who, what, why, where, when, who? Who, what, why, where, when, who? And it's really important. And how? I missed how. Who, what, why, where, when, who? How, why? I <laughs> never get confused. It's open questions, guys. Who? Who are you looking to help? Why are you looking to help? How does that affect what you do? Who's involved in this decision? How does that work through the processes in your organization? Why? What is your time frame to use a new supplier? Um, so um, I think it's just really important that you think like a two-year-old. Again, more of this in the book, but I think that whole section around process is imperative to, to really understand the process is how you learn to sell. You don't manufacture a, a, a vacuum or a hairdryer by just putting cobbling things together, going through the process. So um, I'm gonna pick up on, somebody said that they're, you think they're more blue than they would like or something. Again, blue is brilliant for process. It makes a big difference. So we have got um, 13 minutes left in total. You see, I've got my little fancy perf timer. So this is my top tip for anybody that is doing any webinar-based businesses at the moment, business at the moment, or speaking at events. Make sure you stick to your little timer. And perf timer is a free app. So that's my top tip. So um, sales strategy. Let's have a wee look at that. Um, now, again, I talked a little bit about me at the beginning and my sort of backstory, but one of the things I think is important to bring in now is a little bit more of my strategy. And I did see, you know, why would you stand out when you, you know, why would you blend in when you can stand out? So I, I, I've got three, bra uh, three brands. And again, I think it comes back to really knowing who your target market is, because if you don't know who it is, you can't market to them. And if you can't market to them, it affects your sales. So Sales Coaching Solutions is the brand that I started with in 2011, incorporated in 2014. And so I'll go in and I'll work with a small business, maybe get a team of five or 10. But when we pulled the funding, I needed a brand to work with the startups and micro businesses. And um, I needed a name for it. And that's where I phoned one of my clients for a brand name. And he said, oh, that's really easy. You are the entrepreneur's godmother. I so am the entrepreneur's godmother. So again, that is the brand that I sort of grow. And, and that, you know, touch wood, it's been amazing. I work closely with Small Business Saturday, with Enterprise Nation. That then led me going on to like BBC Breakfast. I, I work, I, you know, give some advice to number 10 around small business issues. And the photo on the, my right, maybe your left, I was invited to the Queen's Garden party, but obviously now I'm going to be going to get the MBE. So I don't know where I'm going or when I'm going. Um, and then the other thing is my other brand is Alison Edgar, speaker and author. So, you know, I think it's really important that you understand your clients to be able to put that strategy in place. And it might mean, again, for me, I've got three different websites. I've got three different things, but really knowing who your target market is really helps and having a strategy you know you have to know where you want to go uh, you know I, I i don't know how the mbe came about but definitely getting one was on my radar being on tv and being on lbc and in the media was on my radar so i had to back i've had to put a strategy in place to get there um and again a lot of that comes from collaboration so i, I do believe forbes and i were talking about collaboration all fair before we started, but I think it's really important that you look at ways that you can co uh, collaborate. Um, so then we move across. Now, it's interesting because cold calling, now Anthony, I think Anthony, in my head, you do telephone assassin. I could be completely wrong. I'm really sorry if I have, and you're, you're not that person. Um, but there's a big debate out there in the world about, um, cold calling versus social selling. And again, you know, there's people out there who, if Anthony, if you are the telephone assassin, if not, I do apologize. But like the cold calling, you know, yeah, yeah, continue to cold calling. And then you've got people like Dan Disney who are very social selling. I believe it comes back then to my dad again, <laughs> that you need to know the fundamentals of cold calling 
and and codes or you know that type of sale to be able to social sell so the reason that my dad was good he took the old world and the new world and that that joined together so i believe that it's the combination of both that makes the results so looking at the things you can do straight away is the low hanging fruit for the lack of a better word is bingo um so with bingo what happens is you look at who your clients are so if you have a look here this is just like a really simple fashion so with the clients down one side and then your products along the other so again for example uh, my clients include sky the discovery channel the european commission but they also include smaller insurance companies for example so let's say an insurance company abc insurance company and they buy sales training so they buy one of my products again this is the mistake that a lot of people make is that they will then go do you want to buy my online courses do you want to buy my book do you want again close questions so if you look at again sales training a good question to me would be so um, when the training's done, how do you plan to incorporate that to make sure that the knowledge stays within the organization? So again, I know that coaching makes the difference, but if I say I do coaching, they'll go, oh yeah, I don't think we need that. But they'll say, oh, I don't know how we're gonna do that. You know, what would you recommend? Well, it depends on what, you know, what, what structure you've got, what are your turnover levels of your, um, your sales team? How does that work? How, what, why, where, when, how? So can you see, where I'm coming from that actually to play bingo it's all linked to your open questions and I think what you've got there is um it's you're trying to get a full house so my again my top tip here you know you will have customers and what you probably have been doing again assumption makes an ass of me and you um but I think that the assumption is people will then um assume that the only connection you should have with them is to ask how they're getting on and ask about the virus and ask about their business. But it's not because if you're not asking good questions that you think can help them, then you're doing them a disservice. So purpose, you know, why are you phoning? So many people go, how are you getting on? Yeah, I'm great. Okay, well, I'm really busy at the moment. What do you want? Oh, I just wanted to check you were okay. Have a purpose that evolves in a scale. And again, a customer service. So hopefully that um, that helps you. Um, now, this one is quite controversial, and again, usually it comes through um, it comes through as individual parts rather than one slide. But talking about strategy, like uh, things like speaking at the European Commission, Sky, you know, all of these big big things, I didn't get through any third party that gets me that work. I get all of that type of work myself. So again. I've come from setting up a business from nowhere and I'm, I'm advising some of the biggest organizations in the world, but because I had a strong strategy, not, you know, do you want me to speak at your event? I built the relationship, I asked good questions and then, you know, we managed to be able to, to work together. So I've got people that I, I've got a, ma a marry list. So again, for my strategy at the moment is I am gagging to have my own TV show, right? I've got a really good format. I've partnered up with one of the apprentice winners, one of the A-list um, fashion designers to come up with a show. And I, so I, what I want to marry at the moment is TV production companies and commissioners. So if there's anyone in the audience that can connect me, that's great. If not, so again, but in your business, you're going to have people that you want to marry. Then again, we usually will go, and it's the same with networking and LinkedIn. There's people that you want to avoid. You know, there's people you think, oh, actually, do you know what? We just haven't got that connection or, and it's not people in your industry. So again, I would say that Anthony's probably in a similar industry to me, but I mix with people like Tony Morris, Chris Murray, Dan Disney. They're all in theory my competition, but we build great strong relationships because they understand me. And I think at the moment, having people who understand you in business is so important because that's what gives you the strength and the mindset. But there'll be people you just, you just avoid, you know, Oof. And then again, if we look at it networking, then what you get to do is hypothetically snog the rest of the room, you know, get to know people, ask good open questions. And from there, you can flow chart. Do you want to marry them hypothetically or avoid them? You know, and it's it comes down to time. So I don't have a slide for this. And I did tell Forbes that I was going to uh, cover it. Alison Edgar's big balls. So people say to me, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. And what they do, again, it's based on the Eisenhower 
theory. Stephen Covey also did urgent, important, not important, not urgent. But I find my clients don't understand it. So what we do is we, we talk about basketballs, tennis balls and ping pong balls. And we use a tool called Trello. So if anybody's got a linear to-do list, my suggestion is that you don't have a linear to-do list, that you have a, a, a segmented basketball, tennis ball, ping pong ball. And a lot of people at the moment are cheating sales as a ping pong ball. And actually, it's about moving it to be a basketball. Let me give you another example about client relationships as well. So for you to sell, to bring business through the, 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 the business is a, a basketball. But when you phone someone, you know, say it's you're phoning somebody who's in manufacturing, the machine might have broken down and that's their basketball and you're the ping pong ball. So again, it's to do with the timing and the disparity of the, the balls. So Peter, yes, you definitely can have my details. See, I don't know whether Peter's taking that slide more seriously than we think, but never mind. Oh, you, of course you can. Only joking, Peter. Right, so I'm going to wrap up um, and finish on the last pillar and then we've got about a minute left for questions. So, um, Confidence. Now, this is the one that people, again, they tell, I can't sell. I'm scared of sales. I don't like sales. It's all about confidence. And at the moment, again, I've given you some top tips on music to make you confident, mindset to make you confident. But the reason that I see that people lack confidence in sales, in fact, I know this firsthand, is they don't know the behaviors. They really don't know the sales process. They have a scattergun strategy because they try and sell to everyone and what that does is it leads to a lack of confidence they're too scared to actually start the sales process so again when I do this one live um I'll say who's this who's this so um, I, there's a bit of a lag which is why I'm not really utilizing the chat so I'm going to tell you who it is it's Kate Moss right and for those of you who don't know who Kate Moss is, she is a supermodel. So again, how do you become confident? You really have to look in the mirror and believe what you see. So for me, every day, and I mean every single day, I look in the mirror and I see the supermodel of sales. And because I see the supermodel of sales, you know what? You guys also see the supermodel of sales. So if you can't see the supermodel of sales or the supermodel of business or the supermodel of coaching or the supermodel of manufacturing, whatever it is you do, you need to look in the mirror and believe it. Because if you don't believe in you, other people won't either. Um, and then I'm going to leave with my last slide, who is the lovely Usain Bolt. So sales. Ah, We've now hopefully got you to believe that sales and customer service is the same thing. We've now got you to have some passion and growth mindset that you can take action and to actually know that this is the time that we not just have to, uh, can sell, but we have to sell. But how do you get good? How do you get good at anything? You have to practice. Usain Bolt did not become Usain Bolt without taking on help, getting a coach to help him, to teach him the right methods and practicing it every day. I have been Alison Edgar and it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to take the slides off and I'm going to take, um, actually, I'll take the questions in the chat, I think. Oh, no, I'll put them in Q&A and then I can catch up because there's quite a few. Um, in the meantime, while I'm waiting on any questions, we have literally got about three minutes. Um, I'm going to read some of the comments. So Karen says, thank you, Alison. And, um, amazing advice. I'll be in touch and I'll see if we can collaborate. Brilliant. Crack on. Let's see what we can do. Katie, I lack confidence. So I've hide behind my brand for ages recently. Um, it says more about me paying off. I'm dyslexic. So that's why I struggle with the writing. So uh, the reading. Um, you need to keep going. Yes, you do. Nicola Gawkin is now the supermodel of creativity. Big round of applause for Nicola. Um, uh, Celia says it was brilliant. So useful. Full of golden nuggets. I try and give as much as I can. Um, so like I'm not a member of any of the speaking organizations. I'm kind of self-taught. And, you know, I take, I watch, I watch what I think makes an engaging talk and I try and see if I can embed that into mine. But again, I think if you love someone, if you love someone, if you love something, it makes it easier to do it. And I love sales and I love speaking, so it really helps. Um, now there is no 
questions coming through, but we do have, um, I think we've got about three minutes. So again, if you've got um, any questions, I will take them. If not, what I'll do is I'll give you my most frequent questions that people ask. So um, LinkedIn is one of the things that people talk about and I love LinkedIn. I'm a huge fan. So um, they ask me about that my strategy. So on LinkedIn, I've got 21,000 followers. It's my biggest platform because I'm obviously doing a lot in B2B. Um, and they, they say, like, should you have a small, um, a small LinkedIn group of people or a large one? Some people will not connect to people they don't know. For me, again, I got a large one, but it's about trying to find oil. Does that make sense? So you can't just put things out and expect people to buy. It's about building the relationship and digging down because when you dig down in the relationship, again, good questions, think about the Titanic, then you can really find out, you know, what you can do to help them. And it sounds a bit cliched, you know, that people are like, I'm here to serve you, I'm just here to help. Um, mm, yes, but also you're running a business, so you're not running a charity. And again, that's where the snog Maria Void comes in. Um, uh, fantastic presentation. I used to be terrified of uh, selling and telling people how good I am at what I do, but I'm learning. Good girl. Well done. Katie says, um, what are the best online sales platforms for people like me who make personalized ceramics to order? Interesting. So again, Katie, I think a lot of that is a B2B, uh, sorry, a B2C function, a marketing function. So your Facebook ads, um, Etsy, uh, you probably do it. So they take a big cut in there. Amazon take a big cut. Um, again, I think it's quite good if you can do um, have conversations. Uh, Small Business Saturday. If you're not um, on Small Business Small Business One Hundred, you should apply for that because also if you can get somebody on Facebook to share. And again, the marketing guys will know more about this than me because I'm sales. But um, People at the moment want to support small businesses. We know that there's a lot of focus on helping small businesses. So again, if you can, there's a post that goes out quite regularly, you know, I want to support small businesses, who would you recommend? If you can actually get your friends to put a post like that out and say, oh, I would recommend my friend Katie, she makes ceramics. And you're, you're getting better margins. Any other, uh, Mateo says, any other tips to becoming more confident? I think it's knowing your stuff. So again, um, in your business, I, I, I think it's really understanding that, you, so if anybody challenged me on anything, I could back my corner because I know my stuff. I think if you don't know the full product knowledge of your business, I think that affects your confidence. Also, I've just written my new book based on my TEDx called The Art of Getting What You Want. And I think it's knowing your why. So for me, I've just gone from couch to half marathon in 12 months, 14 months, I think. And I've climbed a mountain. I've lost three stone in weight. And I think just having something to focus your attention on, that really helps your confidence. If you're feeling confident in you, other people will be confident in you too. Um, uh, the other thing, right, uh, one, one last thing, because I've got two minutes, is my banks. I talk a lot about segmentation. So basketballs, tennis balls, ping pong balls. How do I live my life? How do I feel that every single day I've achieved whatever I want in my life? Why does that help my confidence? I run three banks. I run the bank of cash, because if I don't make money, I cannot eat and I cannot pay my team. I, I run the bank of give back. Oh my goodness, I love to help. I'm a mentor at schools. I'm a mentor for Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. I'm a mentor for a lot of sort of stuff. Um, and then the bank of faffing around. So again, doing things like this really energizes me. You know, I know that I'll, when I come off here, I'll do some videos. So again, think about how you put things into your bank, the bank of cash, the bank of give back and the bank of faffing around. Right, I reckon I am bang out of time now. And um I've been Alison Edgar. I'm going to stop the recording. And again, book is on Amazon. I've got a webinar on the 6th of uh, November, 15 quid tickets. It's on my LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. And um, I hope that our paths cross in the near future. Thank you.